Hi, my name is Grace Shalom Hopkins and welcome to another episode of the Beginner Spinner series. Today we are discussing color theory for fiber artists. So I have two disclaimers before we jump into this. One is a little bit silly. I feel like I look a bit disheveled. That's because I do look disheveled. So I want to remind you that the sacred is usually messy and as makers, we're great at being messy and as young moms, also good at being messy. <laughs> so. I am indeed disheveled, but that's cool. We're all cool with that. Moving on to disclaimer number two. This is a professional grade, scientific, academic study. Color theory is serious business to a lot of people. I know that lots of you will probably think that I have said something wrong or have incorrect views. So I wanna throw out that this is merely how I approach color and I make no claims that this is like academic level accuracy. This is beginner stuff and it's all meant to be a springboard so you can get more intimate with color on your own terms. So that being said, let's talk about colors. Most of us have a pretty rich and intense history with color. A lot of us are lukewarm to color in our daily lives outside of our creative practice. So before we even talk about color theory, I really want to call you to be a bit meditative about how you approach color. There's so many different ways you can do this, um, but I'll give you two that I enjoy. One is at the beginning of the day, just think of a random color and then make it a point to see that color throughout your day. And you're gonna begin to pick out places and people that you never thought would have this particular color present. It's going to jump out at you merely because you've made the intention to see it. Um, that's a great way to experience color in an intentional way. Another practice I enjoy is just mindfully observing color. So when I see something, I pause and check, have I looked at its color? And don't stop it like, this is brown. Nice brown bag, yo. Instead be like, whoa, what kind of brown? Just don't even have to intellectualize it. Just sit with that color and the way it interplays with the different components around it. Lights, shadows, contrast, aging, whatever comes to mind. Just take just 10 more seconds than you were going to initially and really experience that color. And if you do that as often as you think of it, you will have a very rich color filled life because colors they want to be seen they're already eye popping even the most unintentional uninspired dullard <laughs> will be seeped in color so if you take it a step further you just can't help but get more intimate with color right so now that we're on our daily life journey, we're, we're experiencing color more intentionally, more vividly, you're probably thinking, okay, so color is overwhelming to me as a maker. Lots of people have a color that they prefer, a palette that they prefer. You may be even interested in like um, personal color palette making, which is a super fascinating thing. Um, a lot of them are broken into seasons and it's based on your personal colors. Um, people get really intense about what colors they like or don't like, especially when it comes to wearables or things that are gonna be in their home. Now, that's cool. I am not asking you to come out of your comfort zone. I'm more asking you to become more intimate with your comfort zone to discover new types of information that it wants to tell you because you're going to find out that it is different than maybe you instinctively thought because humans change constantly and there's always new information to be had. You're also probably gonna find out that you love colors that you didn't think you loved. And maybe you find out that you don't actually love the color that you thought you love right next to your face. It's a, it's a wild world that we're about to jump into if you walk into color theory with an open and curious mind. Let's talk basics here. What are the foundations of color? Again, we're not talking about light or like the rainbow prism or the absence of color blah focus on our, our, our practical goal at hand here. <laughs> the basic building blocks of color are the primary colors, red, yellow, blue. 
here we go. I have this little setup here so you can visualize what's going on. Now those are the primary colors. Secondary colors are what happens when you mix a primary with another primary. So those are purple, orange, and green. Next are tertiary colors, which is a hard word to say, and that's when you mix a primary with a secondary. Okay, so this is pretty basic, right? For color blending or color mixing for dyeing, the thing that I thought here was super interesting is that instead of just mixing the primaries together to make a tertiary color, you can be aware that that's mixing a secondary with a primary. So you're having more control rather than just trying to keep on adding primary or keep on adding because most people approach with adding more primaries and that's not always right and I think most people know that there's a missing link they're not quite sure how to intellectualize that so one of those big missing links is you add a secondary and a primary to come up with a tertiary so you're already starting with a pre-mixed color rather than just keeping on slapping in some primary color <laughs> that makes it real hard Let's talk about color combinations. So complementary is your basic draw a line across the wheel. It can be any which way across the wheel. It is the direct across mate. Those are gonna look good together. Those are complementary colors. They like each other. Analogous is when you're drawing a line. So like dunk, 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 dunk. See what I did there? you're picking mates in a row. So if it's directly before or after this bro in the color wheel, they're analogous. They're gonna work well together. It's why the rainbow works good, is because you're matching them all together in a row. You can do the whole enchilada of a color wheel. It's an analogous color pairing. It's a big one, but it's that guy. A triadic mix is when you make a triangle. So you're picking one and then drawing a diagonal line so you're making a triangle over the top of the wheel. And you can rotate this any which way you want. All right, so you're gonna get a trio of colors that pair nicely together. Some people consider this to be the holy grail of color combinations. They think this is the bee's knees. You're gonna get your front color, your back color, your contrast, the accent color, everything's great. This is all you need. Some people really love this. They spend a lot of time in this zone. I personally am an analogous girl. I like that <laughs> if, we're, if we're sharing our secret color comfort zones. You can also do a split complementary. So you're choosing one, you're skipping a bro, choosing that guy, and then triangulating the one that they both point to. So one, skip, one, draw a triangle. That's a split complementary. You can use this same principle by drawing a square across the board or a rectangle. Basically, all of this is a fancy way of saying that this is just intuitive color picking that people have turned into a science. <laughs> you know, you can follow your gut and see what's happening and play with this lay a triangle in your mind across and rotate it, a square, a rectangle, a split triangle. You can do whatever you want to get the result that you want and it's fun to manipulate it and see what you think is like, ah, and what is great. <laughs> so now that we talked about kind of the more common science-based color theory, the stuff you probably learned in school if you studied color theory, let's talk about three of my favorite ways to approach color. So we'll do two basics and one that I'll really dive into because it's one of my favorites. I also like that one because you compare it with all the other ones. <laughs> so spoiler alert, I think it's the best. Stay tuned to the end. So first of all, Looking at nature, this ties back to our being mindful of our environment practices. When you look at nature, nature has excellent taste and color. So what's cool about nature is it's gonna change based on season and region and how much man-made stuff is impacting it. There's so many different things that are going to come into play. When you're looking for nature-based palettes, some great inspiration choices are the actual outdoors. You can just leave your house. That's a traditional option right there. <laughs> you can also look at nature-based objects in your home. So like I'm looking at the Bulga basket from my parents' uh, town in Ghana. It's dyed 
grass basket. It's got a very nature-based palette. It is man-made in some senses, but it's very nature-based. You can look at that sort of thing. You can look at the grain on your wood. You can go on Pinterest and look. You can look at photography. You can look at museums. There's all different ways to get in touch with nature-based inspiration. So those are all good jumping points there. And kind of a subcategory of this is elements. A lot of people like to look at the elements or astrology to figure out kind of archetypes behind colors that are nature-based. That leads us into tradition, myth, psychology-based color picking. You can go wild looking at all kinds of super cool color correspondences. That was a lot of C's in one sentence. Holy alliterations, bad man. I did not do that on purpose. You can look at it through the lens of psychology. What do colors make the human mind and heart feel? You can look at it through myth, which kind of ties back to our astrology and elements, but a lot of key myths or archetypes have colors associated with them, including holidays, um, religious figures, Pretty much, if you can think it, it's got a color coordinating with it in some culture. Culture is fascinating because people perceive color differently based on their cultural heritage. So in some cultures, white may be a color that you wear when you're mourning. Somebody has died, this is intense, grieving white. Or it could be the kind of color that you slap on your bride when you're trying to get married to indicate things are great, pure, and loving. Maybe not so great and loving if you just slapped it on your bread. That's a terrible word, word choice. But you get the idea, right? Colors have different meanings in different cultures. Now, if you're thinking about using one of the more myth, psychology, tradition-based color palettes, some great places to look are Pinterest, and you can plug in a thing, and then the word correspondence if you're looking for more pagan connotations. You can type in the meaning of color, the psychology of color, color in X culture. You can type in red in different cultures, or red means and then just leave it open for Google or Pinterest to fill. There are lots of different ways that you can access that information. You can also be looking around in different holidays or religious practices, and you're gonna start to notice like, Jesus has a real weird affinity for the white and red combo. <laughs> That's a very Western perception. Um, Christmas is almost always a combination of metallics and red and green. So like red, green, gold, silver. Super Christmas. Um, so your own cultural perceptions are going to be an ally in this endeavor. That leads me to my third and most favorite lens to view color. So I've left this one to the end because I think it is the master of all color perspective. You can lay this lens over the top of every other perspective that I shared today and get a super deep level of understanding of how the colors are playing together. This is weight. Contrast is another way people could talk about this. There are lots of other scientific ideas that come into play here, and I don't dissect it. I purely look at it through this one perspective of weight. Weight is how dark the color is or how light the color is when you turn it black and white. So I like to use my smartphone. Um, Instagram stories is a great way to do this. You pull up that story, take a picture, and swipe it to the black and white filter, and voila, less than two seconds, you've got your black and white. Um, my old smartphone, you could actually turn the camera to black and white and just see the world through black and white, that's even better. You will use it like a viewfinder. So what you do is you have your color options and you take a quick black and white picture. And you're gonna see that the way you laid it out is probably gonna look real wonky in black and white. You're gonna have lights and darks all around. So while I'm talking about this, I'm demonstrating it on screen. So you're gonna see what I'm talking about. Now, here's a color wheel that I've laid out according to hue in color wheel pattern. I'm gonna flop it to black and white and show you the picture that I have on my Instagram story here, and you're gonna see that it's really different. 
Now, I'm gonna rearrange this based on weight. So you're gonna see how I move things around and it completely messes up the order of the color wheel classically. But when you look at it, it has a beautiful harmony that you might not have expected. You're pairing things that you didn't necessarily think looked good together, but they do because of the weight, but not the actual color that's there. Now I have a bunch of these other interesting ones and they were all kind of in the running for my color wheel here, but when I laid them out, I realized they were not a pure hue and I ditched them off to the side. We're gonna bring all those bros back in and then we're gonna arrange them by weight. And you're gonna see how this method really comes to life when there's lots of different weights and shades and tints and hues running around together and this is such a great way to construct a project. You're standing there, you're looking at your stash, you're in a yarn store, you don't know what to choose. You know that you wanna chill in the blue section, but how the heck do I pick which blue that I want? These look analogous, but there's something a little weird about it. I can't put my finger on it. Flop that over into black and white and you're gonna see the world through a whole new lens. It will be great, it will blow your mind. <laughs> So I'm gonna leave you on that note. And if you have any thoughts or experience with color, how do you interact with color in your creative practice, leave it in the comment section down below. I would love to expand my own horizons and see your unique perspectives. If you like this video, hit the like button. If you don't wanna miss out on any of the Beginner Spinner or my other Spin Weekly series where we do demonstrations and knitting projects together with hand spun, you can hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell if you want to, to supposedly get notified by the YouTube gods. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it's a good way to make sure that you have the best odds. <laughs> May the odds ever be in your favor when utilizing the algorithms. <laughs> <laughs> and as per usual, thank you so much to the people who support the show by buying Spin Illusion spinning wheels from me, any of my books, or supporting me on Patreon. Today I sold a polywog to a fantastic lady. Yesterday I sent the shipping notification out to a hopper owner and Patreon people, I see you every month. You help with my groceries. Books, I send those out all the time. All of the ones that you get from my Etsy store are signed. You can find links to all that stuff down below. And with that, huge love note from me to you. I will see you next time.